Welcome again to LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. I am your host, Brona Morgan, and I'm highlighting today an issue that maybe uh, a lot of people weren't thinking too much early on in the pandemic, but it's becoming more and more talked about these days. And the issue is family reunification. A lot of families were separated when the border shut down at the uh, spring of 2020. And long term, there have been impacts on people's lives. And going forward, there are people concerned that maybe we need to come up with a solution so those impacts are addressed going forward if something like this happens again. I have the privilege of introducing today somebody who has been working on the front lines of the fight for family reunification. She is the Honorable Michelle Rampel Garner, MP for a Calgary Nose Hill. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you being here now. Um, you are one of the few people early on during the pandemic who really shone a light on the importance of keeping families in mind when we were making decisions about border closures, who could cross the border, exemptions, things like that. Can you talk to me a little bit about why this issue was so important for you and some of the efforts that you made to try and bring this to the attention of the people in Ottawa? Sure. So first of all, it was absolutely the right decision to close the border at the start of the pandemic. It was something that I for, fought for, uh, given the threat that the you know the pandemic posed to our country. Um, it actually took a long time to get the government to acknowledge that this was a necessary step. Problem was, the government didn't really put a lot of thought around what that would look like, and uh, you know, it's, especially today when. I think we're just starting to really appreciate as, as a country, the impact that pandemic lockdown restrictions had on mental health across the country. Um, the border closures, the, the process that was put in place by the government that really didn't give thought to what would happen to families separated by border measures, I, I, it, it did have a huge impact, uh, exacerbated impact on mental health. And, and a lot of relationships I think have been lost um, that is something that could have been addressed right at the front. We shouldn't have had to, you know, go for months without clarity or certainty on how people could enter the border for family reunification purposes safely. Uh, it was very clear from the onset that we couldn't put in place measures to do that. Um, it was just, uh, you know, a real uphill battle to do that. It took a lot of political pressure. Uh, and there was a lot of politics around this as well, too. Um, even, you know, having to convince some of my colleagues within my own party that this is something that we had to do. It started, uh, you, you know, uh, you'll have uh, Dr. Poon on your show later today. Um, just we had a press conference in Ottawa saying that this was something that the government had to do. And it was just this, it was this month long, months and months long journey to, to, to get the government to understand that this was vital to another aspect of health, mental health for people. And um, still to this day, there are still obstacles that we need to, to overcome to make that easier and more clear for families. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we're here in London. I think you're joining us from Calgary today. Neither of those are border I towns. Am. And so I think some people don't understand how closely related, in particular with the United States, a lot of Canadians are. I'm originally from Niagara Falls. And, you know, for me growing up, it wasn't even like Niagara Falls, New York and Niagara Falls, Ontario were really separate cities. It was very, you know, we were part of one community. And I think that was one of the things that was difficult to get across during the pandemic is how close these families are. This is not that odd of a situation to actually have a binational family. No, not at all. There are, I mean, this issue in and of itself has really uh, highlighted that there are tens of thousands, if not more, uh, people who are in this situation across the country, and it is normative. It's 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 not a you know it's not a very rare situation, as you rightly put it. Um, you know, of course, I myself, I my husband is 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 American. Uh, there are many people um, who are in this boat, um, but it's also not just Canada and the United States. There are we are a pluralism. We are a very diverse country. And many people in Canada have close family, immediate family members that live abroad. 
and um, you know regular um, communication and visiting is is part of what makes our country strong and diverse. Um, so so you know the fact that the border measures didn't take into consideration on the front end that reality was something that did require political pressure to be put on. And I think going forward, uh, one of the learnings that needs to come out of this experience is that we should have a very clear system that says that when, you know, a biological agent or a virus or whatever is detected abroad, if it meets a certain severity criteria, then here's what happens at the border and here's what happens for families. So it's, it's not this speculative, um, you know, arbitrary system that we encountered here, but that it both keeps Canadians healthy and safe and also recognizes the diverse nature of our country. And I think that that's something that the government needs to immediately implement. Interesting that um, part of our pandemic response, I, I would assume that there was a pandemic plan prior to COVID because it's not that like, you know, it's completely out of the pale that something like this could happen in the world. Why did those policies not exist? Do you have any ideas about like what happened that we had to be so reactive? There was a series of systemic failures. I could talk for three hours about this. Uh, suffice to say, I do think we need a national inquiry on this issue so that it not only just doesn't happen again in the future, but like this needs to happen right now. We are seeing, you know, the Delta variant is a great example of how this pandemic has changed in a very short period of time, just with a variant of COVID itself. Um, briefly, uh, the government shut down our early warning system for pandemic and pandemic um, in 2018. We didn't have data. Uh, we didn't see cross-governmental response. Uh, we saw confusing information coming out of the government on border measures, on masking. Um, and, and, and look, I could litigate that. The, the point is, is that we have to do better next time to keep Canadians healthy and safe, but also to prevent, you know, the issues you're talking about today with family reunification. And it's incumbent upon the government to start that process now. Um, the, the cost, like the financial cost of, of reunification, I don't think was adequately considered. Uh, you know, many people couldn't afford to take a month off of work to, to deal with uh, the very arbitrary measures that were put in place on the front end. Um, there was a lot of questions about uh, what the rules actually were and compliance. Um, you know, everything from the cost of PCR testing to the cost of quarantine hotels to the, the cost of quarantine itself. You know, these are all things that could have been done better while uh, keeping Canadians, uh, you know, safe from the spread of COVID. Uh, and those best practices, you know, I just strongly encourage the government now, instead of just, you know, I, I hope that the response isn't to sweep this under the rug, but to take learnings uh, from this situation to make sure that families never have to go through this again. It is extremely difficult to be separated from your spouse for nearly a year. It's extremely difficult to be separated from a loved one if they're in a medical emergency or they're on the brink of passing. That type of emotional experience it could have been prevented and it should never happen to anyone again. And if we allow it to happen again, you know, I, I just sh shame on all of us. So, uh, you know, certainly I, I hope that the Liberal government uh, realizes the gravity of the situation, realizes that there is, putting it mildly, a lot of room for improvement and uh, that they actually work with families who are in this situation to understand what happened uh, so that, again, that no family ever has to experience this. Yeah, we would hope that Nova Family has to ever experience this again as well. Um, for our viewers, um, Michelle, what can, you know, a, a person that's watching this show that doesn't have your platform do to help? Any suggestions? I, I just have to give credit to the families who were so outspoken on this. The Faces of Advocacy group um, really was a wonderful example of how when a group of people across the country speak up, uh, it, it allows for people like me to amplify those voices. So, you know, my biggest piece of advice is, you know, your voice makes a difference and call your member of parliament, um, get involved, put out press releases, contact local media. Uh, that's what activism looks like. And, you know, even though I'm an elected official, everybody has a platform with social media, um, you know, life changed in that regard. And I think the Faces of Advocacy movement really shows uh, how a community can, can change policy. 
Thanks so much. And we're going to be hearing from members of that movement after the break, which we're going to have to take now. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being with us. Michelle Rempel Gardner, um, MP for Calgary Nose Hill, former minister and shadow critic for so many issues. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks Stay with us me. after the break. Welcome back to LDN ONT TV here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Brona. We've just been talking a little bit today about family reunification at Canada's border, um, some of the issues that arose during the pandemic that were really um, painful and difficult for a lot of people and took a lot of work to advocate to make some changes to bring families back together. Um, you heard from um, MP Rempel Garner about this movement, Faces of Advocacy. We have now the founder joining us, Dr. David Poon. He is a family physician from Toronto, as well as John McCall. John is the husband of Donna McCall, who is the person named in Donna's rule, which is something that both um, David and John are advocating for, as well as all of their um, social media supporters and the many members of Faces of Advocacy as well. So welcome to the show, David and John. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. So maybe we'll start with um, David, Faces of Advocacy. Why did it start? Why is it necessary? Where is it going? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were border closures for various reasons. The challenge with these border closures is you had situations where you had a uh, physician um, partner who was pregnant in Ontario, separated from her physician partner in Michigan, uh, who was actually unable to come and support her during the pandemic. There was a lot of these family separations that occurred, and you'll be talking with John very soon, uh, and these are heartbreaking stories. So the face of advocacy began as a grassroots movement in order to address the lack of exemptions for family members to safely reunite during the COVID-19 related travel restrictions. Uh, we ultimately were, spur were responsible for the extended family and compassionate exemptions into Canada. So we could have someone facing the end of life, actually reunite with their family safely, or you could have the situations where you have a partner uh, and you are dealing with cancer in Ontario, actually come and be with you uh, to support you emotionally. We did a lot of studying on the mental health impacts of family separations, and there was a significant burden on these families who are already disproportionately affected financially and emotionally during one of the hardest times of our human history. Unsurprisingly, like I, I can't imagine that that came as a surprise to anybody that family separation has a huge um, emotional, financial, um, even physical impact on the health of people and their well-being. Um, John, can you speak to us a little bit about your personal situation and why, you know, because I know this, you, your story was something that really, I think, mobilized a lot of people behind trying to advocate for family reunification. Right. Uh, well, my family, uh, uh, the McCall family, and that uh, we've been in the Ontario area for 200 years. My great grandfather uh, had uh, seven children there and three of them moved to the US and, and four of them uh, are still in the Peterborough, Ontario area and that there. So, uh, so we, we've had been a cross border family forever and that. Uh, so uh, I married, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised in Chicago. Uh, I married my wife uh, in Peterborough there uh, we met at a cousin's wedding in Peterborough, uh, 1974, 75 there. Uh, we were married in 1983 in Madoc, Ontario, which was my wife's hometown there. Uh, she decided that, uh, her nursing degree was a little more portable than my architecture degree. And we moved to the U S there. So we, we lived in, in the Chicago area, raised our children there, uh, I always promised her that we would return to Ontario uh, when we retired, and we did. There, I uh, built a home uh, in the Madoc area, and we returned in 2017 after 30 some years in Chicago. Uh, but she was a nurse, an ICU nurse. She worked at Kingston General Hospital, Hotel Du in Kingston, uh, Peterborough Civic Hospital, uh, a number of hospitals in the Chicago area there, and. Uh, uh, once she was here, there 
in 2020, early 2020, we were heading back to Chicago and she had a stomach problem that turned out to be a perforated stomach ulcer. Uh, she went in for emergency surgery there and in emergency surgery, they found that she had a, uh, they called it a pouchy liver and that there. Ultimately it evolved that it, she was going to need a liver transplant. Uh, so this was January, February timeframe there. Uh, we, uh, it, it was around the same time that COVID became a problem. We asked our children not to come there, even though she was very ill there, because we thought that it wasn't a good time to, to travel with COVID in the, in the picture there. In March, the border closed. Her condition continued to deteriorate there. Uh, I started pushing for a way to get them into the country, knowing that I would be alone if she was successful with the transplant and I would need some help with, with her care. And that. so uh, ultimately, though, her condition continued to deteriorate. And in August the 10th, uh, she passed away at the Peterborough Hospital. Uh, but all of my pushing of uh, ministers, all the emails I sent there were passed around and there was nothing. Nobody was going to let adult children of a Canadian citizen who didn't hold Canadian citizenship there come into Canada. Now they were entitled to Canadian citizenship. And ultimately uh, we made the decision when we realized that our advocacy was not gonna succeed in an exception there to get their confirmation of Canadian citizenship. They came to Canada, uh, they received that, that confirmation on the 15th of August, five days after Donna died there. That's heartbreaking. And so Which, this, yeah, this story is obviously um, the motivation behind Donna's rule. And that sure. is something that you, Dr. Poon, and your group are advocating for right now. Can you tell us what is the goal, maybe David, of Donna's rule? What does that entail? And what does it ask the government to do? After the Faces of Advocacy were successful in creating the extended family and compassionate exemptions in October of 2020, there was a lot of question on what would be next. And the thing is, uh, John was able to talk to a, uh, a family whose uh, terminally ill uh, wife uh, got to see her sister before she passed away. And we saw the amount of good and, and the, the, the incredible power that could happen. We wanted to make sure that this was entrenched, that this type of family unification could occur for whatever border closure could occur in the future. And so whether or not that's political or biological or some other reason the borders close, you can hear the power in John's words. So we want to create a framework where if the borders ever close, whether it be just in Canadian borders or international borders with the UN, that consideration comes into the plight of families. There can be no better name than honoring the name of Donna McCall, which is why we're calling it Donna's Rule. Fantastic. And now how can people, you know, just like Michelle was talking about before, get involved, support this? Because, you know, family is everything to so many people. So I think this is going to resound with a lot of our viewers. How can people get behind this movement? Uh, at the moment, uh, join us at the Faces of Advocacy and follow letter writing templates or contact your member of parliament because that's what a grassroots movement is. Go to your local elected official and talk to them about why this is important. If there's enough support with our individual MPs across the country, there can actually be legislative changes uh, in order to push this. I've spoken to the Deputy Prime Minister office and uh, they need to see that there's a lot of support. So if you believe that families are essential and that there should be a way to entrench family reunification at times of border closures, tell your MP that. Help us get there, follow the faces of advocacy, do whatever you can to make sure that what happened to the McCall family doesn't happen again. Heartbreaking story, John. How is your family doing now and how are you doing? Uh, well, it's been over a year now. Uh, you know, I mourn my wife's loss every day. Uh, but, you know, we, we're able to go across the border there, I'm planning on leaving this weekend to, for U.S. Thanksgiving there. Uh, my intent is right now I've applied for Canadian citizenship because I'm a U.S. citizen there. Uh, I feel I owe it to Donna to, uh, to get Canadian citizenship, which was, which, was, which was a goal we always had there. But whether or not I stay here or move back with my children will probably depend on, you know, what, what needs I need to fill with my family. And that. So, uh, 
uh, I have a new grandson coming. <laughs> Congratulations. It is all about family, isn't it? I really appreciate you being so honest and sharing your story with us, John. All of your efforts, Dr. Poon, to um, bring families together and make sure that their um, stories and interests are highlighted if anything like this ever happens again. So we're going to have to take a break now and we'll be back with more LDN ONT TV. Stay with us. Welcome back to LDN ONT TV. We've been talking about family reunification, um, binational family separation during COVID. And now we're joined by Jaslyn DeClerc. You may have heard um, about Jaslyn because I know she visited a radio station here locally in London to talk about the issues that her family has faced. Welcome to the show, Jaslyn. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, just talk to us a little bit about your family and how seriously that you've been impacted by um, family separation and the, you know, the border policies during um, these last couple of years. So I live here in um, just outside of London, Ontario, in Tilsonburg. Um, my fiance lives in just south of Finlay, Ohio. So our distance between our house is about three and a half hours. Um, we've been together for four years and we have uh, an almost three-year-old daughter together. And she's the light of both of our lives. When the border closed, she, her and I were stuck here in Ontario and her dad is in Finley. Um, he works there and I work here. We need both of our incomes to support our homes. So there was no options for us to see each other as we were both designated non-essential travelers. And so ultimately it's um, your daughter is who you advocate for because she has, I think, seen her dad maybe once or twice over the last couple of years. Yeah, out of, uh, I've counted out of 601 days, um, we've seen him 30 days. So she spent more than half of her life not with him um, versus when the border was open, we spent at least every, every weekend, if not every other weekend together with him. And she's not with you today because. Yeah. So, um, when the news of the U S border reopening happened on Monday, um, we got in the car on Friday and I drove her down there. She's staying with her dad for two weeks of daddy and daughter time. And then I'll rejoin them for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Incredible. So, you know, somebody so small, so young has literally only been able to spend 30 days with her father over the course of the last couple of years. I think this is why you're a part of this movement as well and hoping to make some changes and make sure that this is something that's highlighted going forward. Can you talk to us a little bit about your involvement in the movement that we've been talking about today? Absolutely. Um, as soon as I heard that there was going to be a group that came together to focus on reuniting families, I jumped right on board to do whatever I could. Um, I became very strong on Twitter, um, tweeting daily about the hardships that I was seeing both on my fiance and my daughter just having to FaceTime each other instead of being able to hug each other. Um, he's, a, he's a dad. He wants to come home after a hard day of work and get a hug from his princess. And instead he had to watch her blow him a kiss over a video screen. Um, he watched her grow up from a toddler into a preschooler and he wasn't able to actually be a part of any of it. He watched her kick a soccer ball over a video screen and that's nothing a parent should ever have to go through if, you know, by their choice. And so, and I guess that is why you fight and why so many people um, are part of this movement to make sure that this, you know, families are given some consideration going forward. And we really thank you for sharing your really tough story today, but I'm really happy to hear that Maddie is in, uh, in her dad's arms right now, hopefully. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jaslyn. Spoiled like crazy. I talked to them this morning and they were, uh, eating breakfast and I don't know what the rest of their days plan. They're keeping it a secret from me, I think. So I don't get jealous. <laughs> so we guess we get to end the show today on a happy note that um, Maddie is having a good time. We don't know what she's up to, but hope, I'm sure it's something awesome. Thank you so much, Jaslyn, um, David, John, and Michelle, all of our guests this week. And thank you for tuning in. And hopefully you'll be back next week for more LDN ONT TV.